Zach, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing this evening? I'm, I'm feeling pretty amazing, as I think anyone involved with the Green Party uh, feels today, although quite seriously, it's a good, important point to say that although things have gone really well, I'm really aware that lots of people have worked really hard and either not got across the line or um, held onto their seat. So I just want to send love, kindness and um, solidarity to those people. Uh, but without a doubt, I think the very, very obvious story is how successful these elections have been. And I don't think the magnitude of this moment could be missed. It's really, really clear that um, there's been an outright rejection of a Conservative Party. I think there's, I'm sure we'll have this discussion now, lots of reasons why people have moved from the Labour Party to the Green Party as well. But I think it's probably not being reported in the media narrative more widely that you can spin it a different, lots of different ways, but the Green Party have done really well. And the Lib Dems and Labour are probably quite happy with themselves, but it's only the Conservative Party who I think will be really unhappy uh, at the end of these results. And I think that's a, you know, that's a tick for a progressive Britain. Talk us through then the most exciting results that have happened for the Greens overnight and over today. So I think the most obvious one that if you've, if you've not heard about this one, then where have you been? But Mid-Suffolk, uh, we have got an outright majority on Mid-Suffolk. This is particularly exciting because we have won the popular share of the vote. That is also a parliamentary, a part of a parliamentary constituency of Waveney Valley, where Adrian Ramsey, the Green Party co-leader, is standing. So how people vote locally and how they vote nationally is different. And we shouldn't pretend that that is now an easy job and job done. But I think it's a really clear argument that targeting seats at council level and then encouraging people to vote for Greens nationally can be a winning argument. I think we need to be careful with that argument. We want councillors for councillors sake too. They're not just stepping stones for members of parliament. We know how important the need for a local councillor is on things like local services, libraries, potholes, the roads around, et cetera. All of those things are really important. But it's also undeniable to see that there is often a trend where when a party builds up a base of support and we target, that's where your next MP comes from. And not from yesterday, but just if people don't know, I repeat this about 20 times a day, so why not here now? Uh, Bristol West, there are 20 councillors, 17 of them are already green. So it's the same thing for Carla Denya in Bristol West, that it's very clear if you got everyone to vote, nationally how they did locally, Carla would be our next MP and that's pretty exciting. Um, and sorry, I'm rambling from your question, but I think it's also worth saying there's lots of places that didn't necessarily get coverage beforehand in the same magnitude, but have just been brilliant results. I was going to say shock results and not shock results, especially to the people who are there. They know how hard they're working, but the media didn't pick up on them. So I'm thinking of places like Forest of Dean, who are now the largest party on the councillor. East Hertfordshire is a very obvious one. 2015, that was 100% Conservative council. There wasn't a single other councillor. Then we got two green councillors on that council. We now have 19, which is 17 gains um, and two holds. And I mean, that's just amazing. And then finally, I think what's often missed um, in politics, uh, particularly in the national media, are just those personal stories where you go help out on a campaign and you just think that is someone who I know would be an amazing councillor. And I just can't wait um, to see them get across the line. So I'm thinking of Amanda in the Wirral, who I've seen get across the line today. Um, Akua, both uh, were people who defected from the Labour Party along with Joe Bird. It's been brilliant to see them hold their seats. That sends a clear message that um, even people who defect from the Labour Party, where we work and show hard their strength and, and their community feeling, we hold those seats. And then finally, Seven Oaks. Um, I have a personal attachment to Seven Oaks because my partner's father was an independent councillor on Seven Oaks Council about 20, 30 years ago before he died. Um, I was there campaigning yesterday. We've never had a councillor on Seven Oaks Council. And we got three across the line, Laura, Shani, and uh, Mark, and I think those three are genuinely going to be brilliant councillors. So I'm excited both because it's a breakthrough on the new council, but also just that personal touch, really, that you spend a day or two or several days with people campaigning and you just think, I really want you to win. And it's just amazing when people do. Obviously, you've talked about the success stories, but it's not all been a rosy picture uh, in these elections. So we are still getting results coming in, I think, now from Brighton Hove. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to see them yet, but uh, the Greens have lost seats there. They've lost control of the council. And we've also seen a few other places where there have been green losses, such as York, where every Green was um, who was up for election didn't win. What's going on in those places? Talk us through your assessment of what's happened in Brighton Hove and if you know the detail of York as well. Well, the first thing is to say how sad I am. Um, I won't linger on that because it doesn't make for a particularly exciting interview, but I think it is always important to say that when people work hard, and we know you can't become a Green Party councillor without working hard, especially under a first-past-post system. 
So um, I just want to acknowledge that, first of all. In York, you know, I'm always nervous about kind of blaming other parties' leaflets or propaganda because ultimately we can get better arguments and we need to find different ways of communicating our arguments. So I'm talking about us as a party. I'm not singling in any local party here, but I think we always need to look at, you know, we've had these amazing gains, but actually where we've had losses, what are the lessons from that? In York, I think it is worth saying that you know, the Labour Party put out a leaflet everywhere that said they were going to freeze council tax using oil and gas windfall, which, you know, is something that it's not even, you know, sometimes I think political parties can get away with a bit of cheeky kind of mixing national and local. But that is so far away from what can be done uh, at the local level that that was pretty grim. And I think in Brighton and Hove, it's really worth saying that uh, Brighton and Hove Labour uh, controlled the administration and then it collapsed partly due to infighting, partly they just didn't know what to deal with some of the crises there, cost of living crisis that's heavily hit uh, uh, the tourist industry there and, and various other kind of issues in that area. And I'm really proud that the Green Party stepped up and took control of that administration. And I don't think it's not for me to say that I regret it, but I imagine people in Brighton Hope wouldn't regret it either in that Green Party. I think we can be really proud of what was achieved there. I think it's also fair to say that when you do that, when you take take on an administration that you've not won outright, you take it with a whole set of problems and you take it from a a very aggressive Labour Party that frequently worked with the Conservative Party to team up on the Conserv on the Labour of a Green Party minority administration. That is going to be difficult. Now, someone watching this might go, "That's politics." You know, team, you know, other parties, opposition parties, often criticise the ruling or largest party, and that is politics. And they agree it is. But I think we've done, we've shown in other places how it can be so different. So in Lewis, for instance, where Greens work alongside the Labour Party and they work constructively with them. And now we've just seen a wipeout of Tories. I can go straight to the London Assembly where uh, with London Mayor Sadiq Khan, I have a really constructive relationship with him where I do criticise him. I expose where there's gaps in his plans, but also when he gets things right, I, I do applaud that. And I just think, you know, you never want to sound sore about, about losing, but I just think, you know, the Labour Party, party in Brighton Hove probably do need to reflect on if you're winning something is it worth winning in that way what are the longer term effects of this and actually isn't the real problem here a conservative government that for 13 years have implemented austerity on the country and particularly on councils and so often when they could have been joining us in blaming the conservative government and holding them to account it was too easy to um place blame at the, the Green Party. As I say, I say that carefully because I'm sure someone can whip out an example of where the Green Party blame another party too, and that is politics. But also, I think, you know, in election day, especially when we've done so well, it is really important to still reflect on where we've not done so well and gone, okay, what can we learn here and how can we get better next time? And so finally, before I let you go, because I'm sure you've got lots of other media gigs to do, um, my last question for you is really, what do these results, these record-breaking results, and I should emphasize the Green Party has never had success in this scale. Uh, the numbers that are in now are over 200, which beats the previous record of 2019. Um, what do these election results mean for the future of the Green Party? Well, I think there's a few things. So the thing I'm very excited about, I'm not sure if I can announce this, but I am doing anyway, is that hundreds of people have joined the Green Party today. Now, we want more. So I'd encourage everybody to please keep tweeting out, ask people to join the party, particularly if you're a member. If you're listening to this and you're not a member and you're just a supporter, maybe today is the exact time to join. Sometimes when I say that to people, they bring up, you know, a policy that they don't like or something about the party that, that, that they don't think is ideal for their perfect party. I think that's even more of a reason to join. We're a democratic party. We are one member, one vote. And ultimately, it's by having voices within the party pushing for progressive policies and the better vision of a future that we want for society is how we keep that agenda going. So I would encourage people to join the party and have a voice from within the party rather than from without. I think the next thing to do is look at where we've had those breakthrough councils. Uh, I want to give them a little break. They should have a little party and a celebrate. But I think the question immediately has to be, OK, how do we build on this success and how do we immediately start communicating with voters the difference a Green makes in the room? Even if it's just one council on the council, I think straight away of Caroline Russell, for instance, I know I'm being London centric, but I work with her every day in Islington, where she was one councillor for a long time, holding a massive Labour uh, council to, to account. She now has Ernest Stas and Benali doing brilliant work alongside her. And I think that's an example of where you get someone in, you get more people in. There's other places, though, where, well, East Hertfordshire, where you went from two to 19. So we know those kind of growths can happen, too, if we put our minds to it. So I think that's the other thing. And then I think the third thing is, you know, we need a general election. We need this Conservative government gone more than anything. And I think uh, I was about to say from this moment, the party has to be election ready, but that's not true. We've had to be election ready for a little while now. But I think this is a real clear call for action that if we take this as seriously as we need to, if we rise to the scale 
of action that's needed. And if we keep putting on uh, powerful, compelling, persuasive arguments in the media, then the Green Party will continue uh, to get more of a spotlight than it deserves. Obviously, we're a long way from getting the amount of coverage we should have, but we're getting better and better. And I think once we get there, that's exactly how we get more Green MPs. So I think we're on the route. But what we really need is people to join. Uh, we need that big movement. So I'm back to the, to the join ask, please. Zach, it's been an absolute pleasure as always. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Chris. Take care.